Oh, Dennis, you're muted again. Thank you. <laughs> okay, we'll try that again. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm Dennis Peters, Acting Dean of Engineering and Applied Science here at Memorial University. We acknowledge that the lands on which Memorial University campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse Indigenous groups, and we acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Biotic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We, ex we are excited to have our very first virtual Speaking of Engineering lecture as part of Research Week 2020. The Speaking of Enger Engineering lecture series promotes engineering in our province and raises awareness of engineering related issues among students, the academic community, and the general public, which we feel is very important. I'd like to extend special greetings to our guest speakers this evening. Richard Meany, Director, Department of Technical Services. Dr. Leslie James, Associate Professor, Process, Department of Process Engineering. Dr. Kelly Hobbelt, Professor, Department of Process Engineering. Dr. Ting Zhu, Assistant Professor, Department of Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Jonathan Anderson, Associate Professor, Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. I would also like to acknowledge Mr. Mark Fuhrer, Chief Operating Officer and Deputy Registrar of the Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of Newfoundland and Labrador, also known as Paganel. Paganel is an invaluable asset to our program and our graduates, and we are honored to partner with them to bring you this lecture series. I will invite Mr. Fuhrer to say a few words about Paganel's sponsorship a little later. Tonight's lecture is about how Memorial Engineers supported Newfoundland and Labrador's COVID-19 pandemic response. When our province was initially impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic, Memorial Engineers and other experts put their expertise and time to work and join forces with, with members of the private sector to help ensure that our community could fight this global health crisis. Tonight, we will hear from five individuals who participated in such efforts in a variety of ways, from designing, fabricating, and testing critical personal protective equipment, to consulting and advising on chemical compatibilities of soaps and disinfectants, to aiding in the search for therapies and vaccines. Our speakers will each share their expertise and how they contributed to, to COVID-19 efforts. Before we begin, a couple of the logistical details. We will plan to have time for questions after all of our speakers have spoken. For this, we'll use the Q&A feature, which you should see on the bottom right of your screen. You can type your questions in there at any time, and we'll go through them right at the end. I ask that you indicate in your questions to which speaker your question should be directed, and you'll need to be brief since I understand the question box is limited to 256 characters. Our first speaker is Richard Meany, who is a professional engineer with extensive technical and management experience. He holds a Bachelor of Engineering and a Master of Engineering from Memorial. He began his career with CCOR as a research engineer and later moved to Nortel as a manufacturing engineer and manager of mechanical services. He joined the Memorial Department of Technical Services in 2004 as mechanical division manager and took on the role of director in 2008. Okay. Okay, thank you. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Uh, let me share my screen. Thank you, everyone. My name is Rick Meany. I'm the Director for Technical Services at Memorial University. It's a pleasure to be here this evening. Technical Services is a service group that reports to the Vice President of Research, and our mandate is to create uh, custom apparatus and, and, special, and specialty instruments used by our researchers, and to also assist with repair of uh, any laboratory equipment through all the facilities of Memorial. Had multiple roles during the response to COVID-19. Uh, I acted as a point contact for community members seeking access to Memorial's research expertise. We fabricated specialty items to support health authorities and produce laboratory equipment for testing locally manufactured personal protective equipment. As well, I participated on the task force NL's engineering and quality assurance team. The task force had several roles. One was to assist with procurement of PPE 
The other was to, to explore options for locally manufacturing uh, personal protective equipment. And that includes focus was on face shields, gowns, and surgical masks, and nitrile gloves. And for us to be able to offer the testing resources as we were tasked with being the independent testing facility, uh, resource for the, for the task force, we were required to establish laboratories for that. Big picture challenges included the global shortage of personal protective equipment, and this created significant vulnerability. Uh, in Canada, we're highly dependent on offshore suppliers. And to ensure the safety of our frontline workers, PPE required regulatory compliance and Health Canada approval. There was a strong collaborative approach. Uh, we saw strong local alliances. We saw the faculties of engineering and science and medicine actively participating in the initiative, as well as public health laboratories and Eastern Health and the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador. Uh, local companies also participated, that included DF Burns, the Hutton Group, Superior Glove, and also hundreds of volunteers uh, helped out. We, we chose, we established partnerships across the Atlantic region and as well across Canada. These were established at Springboard Atlantic, Dalhousie University, UPEI, the Public Health Agencies of Canada, and the National Research Council of Canada. Some examples of the work that we've done uh, during the response. Apollo Unity is a spin-off company from the Faculty of Medicine, and they were engaged by Eastern Health to help produce uh, some personal protective equipment. Uh, they were producing face shields uh, for the hospitals. And we assisted uh, with the uh, produce the clear visor component. And in the early part of the response, we produced 16,000 face shields. Uh, as you can see, they were the uh, were being cut on a water jet cutter in the bottom left corner. Uh, other very interesting challenge was the supply of hand sanitizer. So the Newfoundland Liquor Corporation produced hand sanitizer for the local hospitals. Uh, but the challenge was how do we deploy them and how do we dispense? So we had conversations with PolyUnity on a Wednesday, Thursday, one week. By that Friday, we had produced uh, a number of prototypes that were installed in the hospitals. And by the Monday, we were given the go-ahead to start producing in the, in the hundreds for the hospitals. Uh, we can see on the bottom left corner, uh, pump adapters. Those are plastic pieces. Those are 3D printed on our SLS machine. And the wall brackets, we got cut on a water jet cutter and then formed on our press break afterwards. It's interesting to note that those are still in use in the hospital today. I uh, also assisted with producing equipment to be used in the labs. I believe Dr. James will give a lot more detail of the testing later on. Uh, but we see here's a, a device for doing differential pressure testing on the right hand side that we used our SLS machine to do that. And an aerosol generator on the bottom left and we used our, some of our CNC equipment to help produce those. Uh, blood penetration testing required device for holding surgical masks, as we see on the bottom left, and gowns require hydrostatic pressure testing, and our manager, Dennis Graham, is doing a setup in our shops, as we see on the, on the right-hand side. What did we discover during the, uh, our response? Well, one is there's an ongoing need for more domestic manufacturing capacity of PPE in Canada. Uh, and it's interesting that the task force, task force NL, is continuing to explore options uh, to do more manufacturing locally. Similarly, uh, and as indicated in the, uh, the, the article below from the Commonwealth Science and Industry Research Organization of Australia, is that this is a global challenge to establish testing uh, to support the manufacturing of PPE. And our ability to create a testing facility uh, from the ground up for testing masks and gowns. This was done within months and it was uh, really quite an astonishing accomplishment. And it was quite, uh, quite wonderful to be part of that. Uh, anyway, it was delightful to be part of this presentation and I uh, hope you enjoyed the other presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Meany. Our next speaker is Dr. Leslie James who is a professional engineer and an associate professor in the Department of Process Engineering. In response to the provincial need to ensure adequate PPE when the coronavirus pandemic hit, 
it was immediately recognized that if the provincial, the province was going to manufacture PPE, it needed to be certified. In late March, 2020, Dr. James answered the, the call to develop PPE testing capabilities. She quickly partnered with colleagues at Eastern Health and Mun Medicine to develop medical face mask testing capabilities. They currently hold uh, springboard funding and an NSERC Alliance grant to pursue PPE testing research related to COVID-19. Dr. James. Dr. James, we can't hear you. You're muted. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Peters. So, I can you see, uh, see my screen? Perfect. Okay. So, um, as uh, Rick Meany just said, Memorial was tasked with coming up with testing capabilities at Memorial. So, the call went out to ask who could help with. PPE testing, and in looking at the tests, I realized there was a lot of similarities with enhanced oil recovery, more importantly, transport through porous media. The porous media being the masks and hopefully not the gowns. Um, first, before I discuss our testing and what we actually did, I would like to acknowledge our funding sources and our partnerships. Uh, we have funding through NSERC, Memorial, and Eastern Health for some research on testing novel face mask materials and looking at some uh, sterilization techniques. And we have had funding from Memorial, Eastern Health, Springboard, and ACOA for conducting PPE testing. Thank you very much, and thank you to our partners at the other institutions, UPEI, Dalhousie, et cetera. I'd also like to um, show everyone on the team. Okay. This will go back. There we go. Um, starting with George Zahariadis, he's the director of the Public Health Lab and an associate professor in medicine. Dr. Kapil Tallin, an associate professor in microbiology. Memorial's technical services. And the Hibernia EOR research team. There's me, rightmost, um, followed by Edison Shripal, lab manager, Fatima Gurartsi, who conducted most of the gown testing, Mazier Mahmoudi, um, who conducted the mask testing and a lot of involvement with custom equipment, Nora Heinemann, responsible for all the proposals and keeping track of everything, invoicing, et cetera. Shervin Ayazi, uh, research engineer, looking at the customization of all the equipment, purchasing and working with Mazi and making sure the equipment tested to capabilities, and Syed Jafari, who helped with the testing. So it was a huge effort. And essentially, Memorial's PPE testing lab can conduct the necessary testing for medical face masks, with the exception of the um, fire, cap uh, the fire resistance of the materials. So we can anything related to the filtration efficiency we can do, starting with the bacterial filtration efficiency that's done at the public health lab, latex particle filtration resistance to synthetic blood and differential pressure. And then we are conducting the gown testing uh, water resistance, uh, the impact penetration, as well as the hydrostatic pressure tests. So when we're interested in mass testing, what we're actually interested in determining is one, will the masks not let any blood penetrate, which is super important in a hospital setting or a medical setting. We're interested in ensuring that there is a an efficiency um, to the penetration of particles. 
So in this case, we're not going to use live coronavirus. We're going to test that through the use of latex particles or latex spheres, as well as a bacteria that's used in uh, many uh, live bacteria tests as a surrogate for the other bacteria or vir viruses. And then there's a correlation made between the virus and the actual one that we use, the staph. Um, uh, Staphylococcus aureus, there we go. Uh, and then we also want to look at the, the differential pressure. So ultimately, the EOR lab, Enhanced Oil Recovery Lab, got involved because we were, you know, we can study essentially the flow of fluid and particles through rocks, be it oil, water, and gas, or if we're talking about air and small particles through masks and again, hopefully not gowns. So what we did in the lab with the help of technical services, established a different And as Rick mentioned, and this keeps jumping around, apologies. And now it's going to go back a few. So we are going to, okay. We'll try once more. There's a, there's a lot of delay happening. Okay. So right here with the differential pressure test, what we're looking to do is take five different areas of the mask, random areas and determine uh, the differential pressure across that particular area in the testing apparatus that's shown on in the middle. On the right hand side is the pressure entering and the pressure or the differential pressure and the volumetric flow rate of the air flowing through the mask. This gives us an indication of how easy the mask is to breathe through. Okay, so um, conversely, you don't want it too easy to breathe through where we're not going to be able to filter the particles. The blood penetration test is the, a really neat one because what we're looking at doing here is actually splattering blood at the mask at pressures related to low, medium, and high blood pressure. So I just want to show this one little bit. And so it has to actually shoot through the hole and it splatters this fake blood, by the way, uh, that has the same viscosity, so same properties as real blood the thickness or viscosity of the blood, as well as the interfacial tension of blood. And then we look to see that the blood didn't actually penetrate. So again, in the lab, we're used to measuring viscosities of oil and interfacial tensions between water and oil and different surfactants and oil, et cetera. So that was easy for us. Um, in determining the particle filtration efficiency, instead of using live coronavirus, we used latex spheres and essentially wanted to determine um, if the latex spheres passed through the mask. So we got an upstream count of how many latex particles there were and what sizes, which is shown on the right hand side, and then how many actually passed through the mask. And so when we're looking at filtration efficiency, um, the theory behind it is it's not just the impact of particles with the actual solid structure of the mask. There's also a lot of attractive forces between the mask material and the particles. Uh, and the coronavirus and other bacteria are charged. And then there's an attractive and repulsive force there. There's also some minor cake buildup or filtration efficiency attributed to the water vapor that's collected in the mask. So when we're doing the mask and gown testing, they're all um, put in a humidity chamber and conditioned for several hours before we actually test it to mimic what it would be like if you were sweating in terms of a gown uh, or breathing through the mask. And as you know, you know, you develop, the, the mask becomes moist after wearing it. Here's the bacterial filtration efficiency that has to be conducted in the um, public health lab due to the bio rating of the lab. And with respect to gown testing, um, 
again, technical services helped by making the gown the hydrostatic gown tester, which is shown here. And I just want to show what happens here. So the water will be penetrate um, the material. Right now, water is in contact with the material, and we can see one drop of water forming before it flipped to the next page. Last but not least is our impact penetration test. Whereby we essentially shower the gown material and determine by mass um, if the gown material actually leaked any water. So we get a mass after it's been showered, uh, of course, on this blotter paper with the gown material on top, and then before, and so the difference is any water that actually leaked through the gown. So uh, lots of fun doing these different tests. To date, we have uh, successfully passed several Newfoundland uh, developed gowns, and we've helped with prototype testing for a couple of mask designs. We also tested some um, some masks or some gowns that have come in from overseas to unfortunately determine that they did not meet the standards that they were supposed to. I'd like to end with a few thoughts on wearing a mask and that is make sure it covers your mouth and nose. Okay, in all of these pictures, it covers the mouth and nose, but in the Middle picture of my friend Liz, you can see the wide gaps between her face and the mask. You don't want to have those. You want to feel like you're breathing through the actual mask. Um, I'd like you to all practice good donning and doffing procedures, washing hands before and after putting on your mask and taking it off, and consider washing or cleaning your masks regularly. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Leslie. Um, next is Dr. Kelly Hobbelt, uh, a professional engineer and a professor in the Department of Process Engineering. Dr. Hobbelt received her Bachelor of Engineering from the University of Saskatchewan, and a Master's of Science and PhD in Chemical Engineering from the University of Calgary. Her research is in green processing, developing processes and products for natural resources for energy required and waste generated in the Dr. Hobbelt has been researching alternative gels for hand sanitizer and polymers for PPE source for biomass. Dr. Hobbelt. Thanks, Dennis. And sorry for the barking in the background. We have adopted a new dog and the other dog is not responding well. So I will try to speak over the dogs um, as I usually do anyways in this online world. Uh, so now for something completely different, I didn't actually do anything. I did more uh, advising and those sorts of things. So I, I'll just cover the two major areas and then I'll just talk about what I think as a province, what I, what I would like to see happen. So there were two major areas in COVID related work. Um, one of them was just advising industry on disinfectant and cleaning solutions. So it, when this first started up, there was a lot of confusion on how you were gonna clean large scale industrial pieces of equipment, like maybe things that were used in food processing that would actually target the COVID virus. And so there were formulations where they said, could we mix just the soap or the surfactant and the antiviral together, just put in some alcohol or an antiviral agent. And, and that's not really how it works because it may inactivate the antiviral solution or the soap, or it just, uh, they don't mix well because they aren't miscible. So there were all these issues around it. And so we are, our advice in the short term was clean it with soap, get rid of the particles and grease, and then disinfect it with an antiviral or antimicrobial. And then if you wanna do more work, then you start to look at longer term, how you might combine different solutions to get a, a better overall, maybe one type of mixture. And this list led us really to talk more about to local companies are making our own antimicrobials and virals. So forestry and fishery byproducts in Newfoundland and Labrador, so sawdust, um, shrimp residues, all these things have lots of 
uh, antimicrobial and antiviral properties. Bark vinegar is, is known to be a very strong antimicrobial and extracts from shellfish and other types have antimicrobial and vi viral, antiviral activity. So that's one area we uh, would like to work with that, that we're trying to work with different companies on because we're already working in the extraction of value added products um, from these biomass residues as is. What happened there? It's not going to go. There we go. Uh, the second area is uh, working with a company called Trajectory, and they're working with TF Barnes, and their idea is to put a PPE manufacturing facility here in Newfoundland, Labrador. The need for PPE isn't going to go away with COVID, and this kind of manufacturing here gives us a lot of uh, security of supply. They're going to start with uh, nitro butadiene gloves. So the gloves that Dennis was, or Dennis Rick, sorry, Rick does work with Dennis, so it wasn't a complete Freudian slip. Um, that Rick was talking about with uh, testing of gloves and manufacturing of gloves. This is the starting point that they want to look at, but this has also led us to hope that we can build on this collaboration to start doing some research and other sources for the polymer base. So these latex and other types of PPE have a base that is plastic or polymer. And again, we have all these resources here in the case of forestry byproducts and fishery byproducts, rock seaweed, chitin from shrimp. These are all potential biopolymers. And so what, if we could produce these biopolymers here, then we actually have a, um, a, a we're using something that's underutilized already because about 30 to 70 percent a forestry and fishery that is harvested is actually ends up as residue. So there is a potential to use an underutilized product. And then there's a potential to maybe extend the product line at something like Corner Brook Pulp and Paper, which is actively looking at this. Oh, look, it's a picture. That's why there's a pause. Every time I do animation, I stand there and go, what happened? And then I realized I was trying to be fancy. So just to give an idea is this is what I was talking about here. We work, we, we're already working with shrimp and crab residues and algae, and this is rock weeds or part of, yeah, rock weeds. So this is stuff that uh, comes up on the uh, shores of Newfoundland and Nova Scotia, and it's actually harvested in Nova Scotia. You can get chitin, alginate, and minerals from there, and then you can make things like medical adhesives, packaging, hydrogels, composite woods, and we have a lot of this, and it's underutilized. On the wood side, you've got this underutilized biomass, saw chips, agriculture residues. You can have them converted directly into natural fibers, or you can do kind of different extraction techniques and produce different types of products, anything from dyes to binders for thermosetting, for resins, to cellulose fibers, and all the way down into these thermoplastics that I was talking about. So this is ideally where um, we'd like to go in the longer term, because again, we have these materials here. So my takeaway uh, is that we can do more here in Newfoundland. We have the natural resources, we have the expertise, we have the abilities. Uh, we've got all of these biomass residues that are underutilized, and that's a loss of value of profits, and it also has negative environmental impacts. And then we can actually make products and technologies that fit in our uh, in our region. So. If we're relying on uh, the larger demographic, the larger regions to determine how we should be processing or what products we should be producing, we're going to be relying on them. So if we can develop it here in Newfoundland and Atlantic Canada, then again, we can be our own suppliers. One of the lessons that we need to learn from COVID outside of that virus is spread if you go to a bar and that, as Leslie said, put your mask on right and wash your hands is that we really need to produce and manufacture more here. And if we can do that, I think we will not only will be able to supply our own needs, I think we can supply the needs of, of different parts of Canada. So thanks very much. And again, mine, that, that's all I have to say, and we'll move on. Okay, thank you very much, Mike. I'll stop sharing my screen. Okay, <clears throat> so thank you. Um, uh, we'll, we'll now hear from uh, Dr. Tim Zhu, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering. Dr. Zhu obtained her PhD from McGill University, focusing on the design of a new accelerometer strap down and the estimation of pose and twist of rigid bodies. Since joining Memorial, Dr. Zhu has, has been devoted to the development of robotic technology to meet the increasing need 
from industry for intelligent, low-cost robots, including a reconfigurable robot for inspection, control of autonomous underwater vehicles, and an intelligent robot for seafood processing. Dr. Zhu? Thank you, Dr. Peters. So now I'm going to uh, share my screen. Okay, so can you see my screen, my slide? All right. Okay. See it, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about my research work on the tele nursing robot design for COVID 19. So, uh, since the outbreak of the COVID 19 in January, we have already witnessed uh, a boom of robotic technology dealing with pandemics. So here on the slides, I have listed some typical applications, successful applications. For example, the first one is a disinfection UV robot, so uh, which uses the concentrated uh, UVC uh, ultraviolet light to kill the virus. So this robot can be used for uh, disinfection public sites, for example, schools, hospitals, uh, and airports, et cetera. So the second one is the m and aerial vehicle, uh, for example, the quadrotors. So uh, these, uh, these uh, UAV can be used for, uh, deli for delivery of a tested kit for, to uh, remote communities. So uh, also very, one very important uh, application is the tele nursing robot, uh, which can help our nurses, doctors, and other frontline healthcare workers to treat the patients where teleoperation. So uh, at the same time, uh, they can reduce the risk of contracting the virus and disease themselves. So one typical paradigm in this uh, field is a robot called Trina. Uh, here uh, on the next slide, I will give a brief introduction of uh, this uh, telerobotic intelligent nursing assistant, Trina, here. As you can see, this is a photo. And uh, Trina was uh, designed to perform some routine nursing tasks like uh, uh, food processing, medicine, and uh, uh, food delivery, cleaning, moving medical devices, and communication uh, with the patients. So Trina was developed uh, during uh, the Ebola outbreak in 2015 by Duke, at the Duke University. So as you can see here, this robot system is composed of uh, three uh, major components, including a mobile uh, manipulator robot, uh, a operator console, and a software system to, for the control and uh, user interface. So the robot is controlled uh, remotely from uh, an operator console where some input devices, for example, uh, the dual haptic devices, a gamepad or 3D mouse, or even the keyboard. So. Uh, as you can see in, in this uh, photo, Trina uses an off-the-shelf dual-armed humanoid robot tarsal, which is a racing robotics factor, uh, and uh, a, an uni omnidirectional uh, mobile base, as well as the three-fingered compliant grippers that's shown here. So a suite of uh, camera, the visual sensors uh, were installed on Trina, including the head camera, uh, as you can see shown here, and uh, the micro Kinect 2 installed on the chest of the robot, as well as two Intel Real Science F200 uh, depth sensor, 3D sensor uh, on the wrist. Okay, so uh, these uh, visual sensors can build 3D maps of the environment, so this information uh, can be provided to the operator's council. So, uh, as a being a milestone in tele nursing uh, robot development, Trina also uh, has some limitations. For example, it can only carry out uh, very basic, easy tasks without uh, advanced human machine interaction tasks. And also, um, it has some limitations for, for example, some uh, slow feedback, difficulty in precise control where tele operation. So, here on this slide, I'm going to talk about uh, our tele nursing robot design which is founded by Earth Circle Alliance COVID-19 grant. So at uh, this stage, we are designing a brand new robotic system, integrating uh, the cutting edge haptic teleoperation, robotic hand and artificial intelligence algorithm. So the motivation for our project is to assist uh, the healthcare workers to provide services without face-to-face uh, -face contact with patients to protect them. 
And the objectives include uh, to allow the healthcare providers to operate a dual haptic device from a remote site uh, remotely to control a 60 wave freedom, freedom dual arm collaborative robot, COBOT. And the second objective is to perform routine clinical tasks, for example, like the sputum collecting, uh, testing, swabbing, auscultating, etc. And also including some uh, basic routine tasks. Okay. And uh, on this slide, uh, uh, as you can see, um, the, this figure illustrates our system design in the ROS uh, in simulation environment. ROS uh, is a robotic operating system, robot operating system. So in which a seven degree of freedom do um, collaborative robot, PR2 is deployed in a remote place. So uh, the PR2, this robot model is used for demonstration purpose. So a healthcare provider such as a doctor or nurse operates the haptic device in another room. The cobot is connected to the haptic device wire communication technology and a robust control algorithm to allow for uh, the cobot to provide some uh, routine clinical tests like a temperature measurement, swabbing, auscultating, etc. So for this uh, tele uh, nursing robot design project, we have some research challenges, including a smooth and accurate performance of the cobot due to uh, the current uh, technical hurdles of the haptic devices, which involve an apparent delay. And we expected to achieve an improvement in human machine interaction, uh, such as the soft tactile contact. Okay, so here on this slide, I have listed the significance of this research work. So we aim to protect the healthcare providers from direct exposure to infectious patients. And we also avoid the tragedy that uh, in some cases, COVID-19 can be spread from healthcare providers who have silent symptoms to non-COVID patients having similar symptoms, for example, coughing uh, due to the normal flu. Uh, also, uh, another significance of this research work is um, that we, uh, we expect that it can speed up the collecting and testing process by allowing one staff to operate the multiple robots at the same time, so it can increase the efficiency for clinical trials. And uh, here on this slide, uh, I have listed uh, some uh, expected approaches to be taken to achieve the research success. This includes an AI algorithm uh, developed to train the robot to detect uh, the different types of routine tasks and carry out operations in advanced bait to counteract the delay of the haptic device. Uh, and the second one is a brand new robotic hand, which is uh, being developed now, which aims to implement fine manipulation tasks. Uh, also a point cloud segmentation methodology is being developed to obtain an accurate contour of individually varied shapes of patients based on the cutting edge computer vision techniques. And the last, um, uh, approach, the last approach uh, is the integration with a small size automated guided vehicle AGV in order to uh, realize the navigation for the COBAT. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank I will you, stop sharing my screen. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhu. Our next uh, speaker is Dr. Jonathan Anderson, who is uh, an associate professor in the Department of Electrical Computer Engineering where he studies privacy, security, operating systems, and their impact in the real world. Anderson? Thanks very much, Dennis, and uh, good evening, everyone. Um, so this is going to be a little bit different from some of my colleagues' presentations in that I didn't build anything to help with COVID. I didn't advise companies on COVID. I'm not planning to build anything for COVID. Um, but like a lot of people, perhaps sitting at home in the early days of the pandemic, because my expertise is in privacy and security and not biochemistry or not in uh, testing things like Dr. Jane's or not in building things like the folks at tech services, um, I kind of felt powerless to sort of contribute to the greater effort. Um, I didn't much like that feeling. Um, I can't fix COVID, but I found a couple of small ways in which I can contribute to the overall solution. And the good news is these are general enough that actually so can you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can use computers to, in very small ways that add up, fight COVID. 
Um, so obviously, initially, there was a bit of a problem. Uh, we have this global pandemic that's um, killing people around the world and causing, leaving lots of devastation in its wake. And I have this question of what can I do? I'm not a biomedical engineer. I don't build labs. I don't test things. Um, my research expertise is privacy and security. So is there a way I can contribute there? Well, so you might think so, but there is both bad news and good news on that front. Bad news in that um, there wasn't much for me to do, but the good news is it's for an okay reason. Um, so in the context of COVID-19, of course, one thing that's top of mind for a lot of people is contact tracing, and in particular, how we can use these little computers that we carry around with us all the time to help us automate or to perhaps slightly speed up the process of contact tracing. So there are lots and lots of different apps that do aid in contact tracing. Um, and in fact, I do have a PhD stu student who's looking into a bunch of different applications, the way they work, their cryptographic properties, how some work differently than others, et cetera. Um, but, and, and although uh, a contact tracing app can't fix everything, there is no silver bullet, no one thing um, that's gonna fix everything. It's something that can help. Uh, but the good news is that, so in Canada, we're using this app called COVID Alert, and it turns out that from a privacy and security perspective, there wasn't much for me to add. Um, and that is because actually, I don't say this very often as somebody who's fanatical about privacy, um, but this is an instance where people got it pretty much exactly right and did pretty much everything Right, so this is an app that has distributed computation, so servers don't know who's um, in touch with whom, who's in contact with whom, all these things are being checked on your device. Um, and in fact, the, the app is so anonymous that not even the app running on your phone knows who you are. It doesn't even know your name, which is uh, pretty great. So we, um, my, my student and I have looked at lots and lots of different apps around the world, um, and actually COVID alert is absolutely fantastic. So the privacy and security check um, and there wasn't really a need for a contribution in that area, but because it was already being done well, really well. So that's that's kind of a good news story. Um, but still, that doesn't help me with this kind of feeling of wanting to contribute. And so I thought about, well, what resources do I have access to? So one thing that my students and I uh, work on is we build operating system software, which has kind of very complex uh, testing requirements, which are different from the way a lot of people use computers. And so we have this dedicated little cluster of computers that runs in a different way from lots of research clusters in a university. Um, and as like everybody else, PhD students and professors and uh, collaborators and colleagues around the world were really consumed with the practicalities of daily life and trying to pivot to a new way of doing everything. Some of these computers weren't being used as much as they usually are which leads to a thought, hmm, is there something that we can do with this kind of specialized resource? And the answer was yes. We thought maybe we could do some folding at home. Folding at home. Uh, one of my colleagues said, are you talking about laundry or something? Well, no, I'm not talking about uh, laundry. So there's a, a distributed computation project called Folding at Home, which is kind of a successor to this thing called SETI at Home. So. Um, in the late 90s, people built this system in which you could um, harness the power of lots of computers that were sitting at home and being unused, download what seemed like random noise from out there in, uh, out there in the, the universe that was being gathered by radio telescopes and look for signals of intelligent life. Now, this was a, uh, a very geeky thing to look for, um, but it turns out that there's an even better use. Well, I don't know, maybe if they're successful and find aliens, well, well, I'll say something different, but it turns out, especially in this crisis, there's something even better that you can do with unused CPU cycles, which is simulate the folding of proteins. Now, this would be a good moment for any biochemists who are listening to plug their ears and say, no, 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 because not going to get the details right. I'm a computer engineer. Um, but my understanding of this is that when you have um, 
viruses and other complex biochemical systems, um, it's not just enough to specify what atoms are in this molecule or something. The arrangement of all of them is also tremendously important. Um, and there can be important things that you can discover when, if you discover the way that a long protein folds itself, if it folds one way, it may expose a receptor site where a drug can get in and do something. If it folds a different way, it doesn't. And so one thing that people can do with unused CPU cycles and even better GPU uh, graphics cards, um, if it's sitting idle, is help simulate the behavior of different complex molecules to see how proteins fold to understand a little bit better how those diseases work and how they can be attacked. So the folding at home project uh, has had, they've had results that have been published in, in fascinating places in, in important journals journals related to Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, um, attacking cancers, breast cancer, kidney cancer, and also infectious diseases, dengue fever, Ebola, Zika virus. And now COVID-19 is a huge focus for these folks. And if you look at that URL, foldingathome.org slash papers hyphen results, you can see lots of science that is being done with essentially part-time donated computers. These folks get a timeshare on your computer effectively when you're not using it. So we installed the folding at home client on seven pretty powerful computers and let them run basically 24 seven for, for some computers a month, for some two, for some a little bit longer. Um, and along the way we did some work. So we installed the client, we did some computation, we, uh, we computed 490 or 492 work units, so a little package of here's some simulations we'd like you to run, um, which actually for a brief period of time put our little tiny cluster at Memorial University in the 90th percentile of users contributing CPU time to the project. Now, as collaborators and graduate students and folks have uh, kind of gotten back into the normal routines. We're using those systems more and more for their regular usage. But along the way, we were able to make a small, but hopefully real contribution to this project to better understand how COVID-19 works. So when we think about the significance, well, on the one hand, we don't know. Um, so I certainly can't say ah, my computers, well, not my computers, the, the computers that were kindly uh, furnished by funding that was provided by the Research and Development Corporation of Newfoundland and Labrador. Um, but still, I can't say those computers found the magic bullet or the silver bullet that's going to kill COVID. Well, no, we can't make those kinds of claims. However, as is often the case with research, um, there's a lot of effort that goes into exploring a lot of paths. Many of them turn out to be dead ends. Some of them turn out to give us gradual improvements. And occasionally along, along the way, as we're putting in the work, we are lucky enough to be there for really, really exciting moments. And so there would be some contribution from here. Maybe it's cutting off a dead end that doesn't need to be explored elsewhere. Um, or who knows, it could be that one of those work units will contribute to a greater understanding of this disease in a way that will have a real impact. But along the way, it's something that we could do with some less reutilized than normal infrastructure. And it's also something that ordinary anybody can use with an ordinary computer at home. So normally people say, don't try this at home. Certainly when we looked at some of the videos that Dr. Jane's had, uh, don't try her tests at home, uh, but do try this stuff at home. So the two things I mentioned, everybody should install the COVID alert app. It's actually um, fantastically uh, designed from a privacy perspective. And if it makes contract tracing even a little bit more effective, it may be helpful in slowing the spread of the disease, helping us get our lives a little closer to normal, um, something. And also consider going to foldingathome.org slash start folding um, and making your own little contribution to this global worldwide effort. Thanks very much, John. Um, that's very interesting. I'd like to thank all of our speakers. Um, we have some time for, for, for questions for a few minutes here. Um, and as I said, uh, you can put your questions in the Q&A um, box on your screen. I keep it under 256 characters, which is plenty, I think, for most of, most of our questions. Um, and uh, tell me who to direct it to, and we can do that. Now, I, I don't see any... Uh, um, 
the uh, any any questions about the content yet. Um, but I'll start off with one just uh, so that I uh, uh, keep things moving here. Uh, Dr. Zhu, I'd like to ask you um, about your uh, your robot, yes. your, your tele tele um, your nursing robot. Nursing, yeah. Yeah. Um, a very interesting concept, uh, and I'm wondering uh, about dexterity of these things. Of course, when, when most of us see a nurse, often we're involved in things like, you know, uh, drawing blood or, uh, you know, I've noticed that the uh, the COVID test, from what I've seen of it, involves sticking a swab up your nose quite a ways, and so it's not, not you know, it, it's quite, quite let's say, um, delicate. You don't want to do it too far or not, not far enough or stick it a little bit sideways. How, uh, how dexterous? Dexterous are these uh, are these robots? Okay, so uh, so thank thank you thank you for your question, Doctor Peters. So for for the question like a blood drawing, I think uh, for this kind of uh, fine manipulation task, dedicated tasks, that will be uh, very hard, very hard to to implement. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, the uh, I have shown in my slides, Trina, uh, that is a paradigm for the tele nursing robot field. They, up to now, they have developed three generations. So uh, the, the first two generations, uh, they have implemented some uh, uh, very basic easy tasks like uh, uh, moving medical devices or preparing uh, food uh, processing, perce food processing and uh, medical delivery, et cetera. So you see these are very, uh, not, to, not that fine manipulation tasks here. <laughs> And for for the third generation, they have changed the uh, the, the torso of the of the uh, dual arm the robots from Rethink Robotics to uh, uh, to uh, another brand. So uni uni you are robot robots. So uni uh, uni so universal robots. So that can correct a, a very a much more compact structure for the for the for the by axial uh, for the for the for the by direction uh, by. Um, by for the manual by manual uh, operation for the robot itself, and and uh, till now, I think uh, for our project because uh, this project uh, started in uh, this September, so still we are in the conceptual design process. We are we expect that we can um, finish. Firstly, we can complete some basic routine clinical tasks uh, like uh, what uh, uh, Trina can complete now. And based on that, what uh, what uh, we'll, what we'll, we are we're going to do is to complete some uh, like uh, auscultating these uh, tasks for some nursing task and telemedicine. So this uh, this is our plan. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, maybe I'll throw another one out there just while we're, while we're just uh, certainly uh, any members of the audience, uh, I encourage you to stick your questions in the question box. But in the meantime, if, you, if there's no questions, I'm gonna throw one at Dr. Anderson. Um, so the uh, the folding at home project is really interesting and uh, you know, lots of us have computers that sit idle for a lot of the time. Um, is there any any uh, effort required on the part of the user for that? I mean, do I need to start it going and say, "Oh, I'm not going to use the computer for these hours" or anything like that? Or no, no, um, it, very, very little. Um, so you basically need to install some software um, that will look at the usage of your computer. It's not going to get in the way when you're using your computer for other things. Um, but when you go to bed and your computer is sitting idle, or for people who aren't computer engineers, perhaps your computer is idle even when you're not in bed, um, <laughs> then under those circumstances, when the computer is not being heavily used for anything else, it'll automatically make some progress, do a little bit more work on a folding problem. Um, and overnight, it can do a surprising amount of work. Um, and although, you know, I did use some servers that have pretty beefy processors and things to do this work. Um, you would be, well, you perhaps wouldn't be shocked at doing research in this area, but many people would be shocked just how powerful the graphics cards are in their ordinary desktop computer, laptop computer. They can actually get a lot of work done. Um, so yeah, it, it's something that's easy to do. You don't have to schedule it. In fact, you kind of forget that it's running, except that uh, when you get up first thing in the morning, your computer isn't asleep, it's, it's working. And perhaps the fan is on because it may have been working pretty hard. Um, certainly it will use electricity, uh, not that much electricity. Um, it'll use some electricity, 
But when you think about the alternative things that people do with spare CPU cycles, like mining Bitcoin, um, this is definitely a much greater societal good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at the time and thinking I, uh, I'll, uh, I'll cut myself off and not, not ask any more questions. Um, and we'll move on to, uh, uh, to the next part. So I, I'd like to thank all of our speakers tonight. I've enjoyed the, uh, listening to your, your presentations and for giving your, uh, your time and energy to helping us beat COVID-19. Um, and now I'd like to call on uh, Mark Fewer to say a few words on behalf of Pegamo. Mark? Thank you, Dennis. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Great. I have to say that was a fantastic session. Uh, it's, it's quite amazing, you know, the speed at which a response was mobilized while uh, still producing such quality resources. Um, you know, I think the power of innovative thinking and collaboration was certainly evident in the approaches taken by the speakers uh, tonight and their respective teams. Uh, at Peganel, we're always aware of just how much engineering and geoscience affects the world around us, especially in ways that are not always seen or understood. Uh, as we just heard, engineers have been instrumental in the local combat against COVID-19. And such is true in various ways all over the world as we fight this global health crisis. While many are aware of the fantastic scientific and health-related achievements we've had in relation to treatment and preventative measures with respect to this pandemic, it's not always obvious how engineering is involved in those advancements. And tonight's session has really reinforced that. At Peganel, we're incredibly proud of the professional excellence exhibited by our members and for how public protection and the advancement of society is always held in the highest regard. On behalf of Peganel, I extend a sincere thank you to the speakers, Leslie, Kelly, Ting, Jonathan, and Rick, as well as to Dennis, Jackie, Paul, and the entire team at the Faculty of Engineering for making tonight's event possible. I believe this is the first virtual Speaking of Engineering event that's been held, and you did an amazing job with it. Peganel is delighted to sponsor the event, and we really value the close connection that we have with the Faculty of Engineering. We look forward to our continued good relations with the faculty. Finally, thank you to all the attendees watching from home or wherever you may be tuning in from. I'm sure you'll agree that tonight's event was both insightful and inspirational. On behalf of Peganel, we wish everyone good health and happiness. Thank you, Mark. And we're very happy to partner with Peganel for the speaker series. Um, Thank you everyone for joining us this evening. And before we conclude, I'd like to give a brief shout out to uh, Jackie Locke, our communications advisor, who has worked hard to organize this event, and to Paul Martin from CITL, uh, who has helped to keep the technical side of things in order. Uh, I hope that you have found uh, the presentation to be interesting, and uh, I hope you will join us again for future events. Good evening, everyone.